just to like scoot to a to try to make it tangible for a moment and then we can scoot back out to some of the branching topics around this like the vision that that we come up with so far which maybe most of you have looked at the cooperate wnc website and this is articulated there too but um the kind of sound bite is that the idea is to use collaborative economics to support a regional network of physical community centers um, and those physical community centers are the place where um, multiple human services are provided, healthcare, childcare, food access, um, events and education, um, all kinds of different services, depending as we'll talk more about on what the needs of each community where the, the center is located are. Um, and then also to serve as points for um, demonstration and just production of food and medicine and other, other physical yields from climate resilient farming systems. And to just mesh it together, right, right like that. To do it in community centers where there are all these services provided, there's food and medicine coming out, people go and learn about really amazing land use planning, really amazing building and energy practices and experience that and then can go out and replicate that. Um, and so, that's kind of the, the core idea. And then the collaborative economics are things like a credit union, like having our own credit union or working with an existing one. I, I just got ma met with Jean Hatley. And if y'all know Jean Hatley, yeah. So she's the, um, yeah, basically in charge of, of the Western operations of self-help credit, Western North Carolina operations of self-help credit union. Really amazing person. Um, who has really deep value commitment to a lot of the same things and is really a systems thinker. And I met with her about, can we work with self-help credit union um, to basically do what we need to do rather than creating a new credit union, which is a giant pain in the butt. Um, and then through savings pools, which we'll get more into those in detail in a second, which is something that's coming out of New Zealand a lot, but people have been doing all around the planet for a long time, including in Emma, I learned right there with Dulce Lomita. Um, and time banking, which is a, uh, time banking is a digitally driven uh, alternative um, economic mode. I almost called it a currency, but it's not really a currency that basically one person's hour is worth an hour. And that's what it's worth, no matter whether I'm a high powered specialized attorney or vacuuming a carpet, an hour is an hour, right? But what it's in practice, what time banking tends to be used for is exchanging higher level services. Um, so for instance, the Stephanie Rierich, who um, is running the, the humans organization out of, out of Madison, Wisconsin, has set up this international time banking system on their website. And the purpose of that is to help people who are starting regional mutual aid networks to get access to the expertise that we need from lawyers and special types of accountants and so on by, through a time banking system without having to spend 300 or $500 an hour to do that. Um, so that, that time banking system is enabling that. So those collaborative economic things are then what we can use to support the community centers. For, so for example, let's, let's give this example here, and this one is on the website because it's such a good example. And I'm, I don't name her on the website, but I, I think she's okay with me naming her now. There's a woman named Gr Graeme Potter, um, who's a doctor in Silva in Jackson County. And um, she has a rural, um, primary care center there. Just she like, took an old house right outside of the town of Dillsboro next to Silva. Um, and she bought this old house on 42 acres of land. And um, she converted the house into a primary care um, facility about five years ago. And she now has 2,000 patients signed up who come through and get primary care with her. And she's a holistic doctor and kind of works at that level. And she got in touch with me a couple years ago, kind of on the permaculture front. She just had in mind just designing edible landscaping for a property, kind of. But we went a lot deeper than that and ended up coming up with this idea of a community-supported health association where, um, where she builds an additional community center building there on the property. And then that building becomes a place where people sign up for, they can sign up for different packages. That's one way it can be used. And the package includes visits with her as a physician, access to different events and classes related to health and ecology, as well as access to food that is grown on that property. 
uh, through silvopasture systems that we're now developing, converting 20 acres of degraded pastures into silvopasture for raising pastured animal foods there. Um, and so where does that dovetail with the mutual aid society with Cooperate WNC? Well, how is she going to get funding to build that community center building? Right? That's, this is where you run into one of these obstacles that permaculture systems always run into. Well, it would be really nice if we had $400,000 to build this community center building, but I haven't found that in my couch, and I'm not getting it by selling dried mulberries in the short term. I think dry, there's a big future in dried mulberries, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm serious about that. But, uh, but it's not going to get $400,000 in the short term for building a community center. And, but, and how are you going to get people educated enough to even grow the mulberry system to be able to farm and dry mulberries? Well, you have to get them through a mutual aid society to get the education out, right? So how do you get the money for that initial capital investment? So this is where something like Cooperate WNC comes in. And I want to bring in the biological kind of metaphor that I was teasing earlier uh, with the whole, old, you know, the whole cultural forest and queer cutting and cultural topsoil and all that. You all remember back to that? It's been a long day already. But, um, so in, in this, this uh, imagery, biological imagery, what we've come to think is that Cooperate WNC is a mutual aid network. It's the mycorrhizae of the economic, um, cooperative economics of the region. So what are mycorrhizae? Can someone speak to that? Yeah. It's the interconnectedness of the soil and all the little, uh, what do you call it, the network of uh, microbes and bacteria and everything that no tilling is uh, essential not to break it up into um, those kind of practices that destroy yeah. the soil. Right, so, so myco is fungus and rhizae is root. Mycorrhizae, so mycorrhizal fungi are those that associate with the roots of living plants, unlike sapro saprophytic fungi, which break down dead plants. And um, right, and just like you said, they connect it all together. And if you look out at, it, at any forest, most trees and shrubs have associations with mycorrhizal fungi. A lot of trees can't live without them. And it's this, there are these species of fungi that spread through the soil and they tie multiple trees, individual trees within the same species, but also trees of different species together. And they channel information and nutrients between those two, right? So the nutrients come in the form of sugar, usually, uh, that's a result of photosynthesis in the trees, but also in the form of different special minerals. And then the information comes in the form of hormones, right? Plants have hormones, and they're sending signals through, the, through their own roots and through the mycorrhizal network that signal other trees. For instance, if a tree gets attacked by a pest, it'll send a signal through the mycorrhizal network that tells other trees nearby to put out compounds that are pest confusers or toxic to the insect pest, right? So they communicate like that. So we come to think that Cooperate WNC is a mycorrhizae. So what, what does that mean? Well, what are the trees and shrubs in the system? I think of Grain Potter's Place in, in Jackson County like a tree or a shrub. It's an existing organization, an existing thing that's happening that has initiative and resources. The issue is that it's not connected to a larger sourcing for nutrients and information, right? It needs nutrients. That's money is one form of nutrients in human economies, human culture, right? So how do you get access to more money? By collaborating at the scale necessary, right? And so savings pools, like we're talking about, um, haven't gone deep into them yet, but what a savings pool is, is like a 10 to 20 person little informal way of, of sharing resources. Everybody gets together uh, once a month and puts in $50 or $200 or some amount that you determine. You start to accumulate money in a shared savings account or stuffed into someone's mattress, whatever. And uh, then say that I want to start a business and I need a special $10,000 piece of equipment like the Nutty Buddy Collective. You all know the Nutty Buddy Collective, right? Who are processing acorns and walnuts and hickories. They needed a $10,000 piece of equipment for processing nuts, right? Instead of having to, to scrabble around and try to get that money and borrow it from their cousin or whatever, they put in a proposal to the savings pool that they're part, they're part of and say, we want $10,000. We're going to pay it back on these terms. Everybody in the savings pool asks them hard questions, helps them develop their idea better until everyone's satisfied that it's viable and they can really pay the loan back. So you get some mentorship, 
right? Relational economics worked in with that too. And then they get the loan, buy the equipment, pay back into the savings pool. Then as they're paying back into the savings pool, they have to pay back more money than they borrowed, but it's not interest. It's not going away like when I pay interest on a mortgage. That money actually is still my money. After I finish paying back the loan, say that I paid back 15000 instead of 10000 as soon as I'm done paying that loan back, I could take that 5000 out whenever I want. Right? So it's no interest, but the principal continues to grow because everyone's putting in money month after month. It's kind of a way of incentivizing savings and creating group accountability for savings. Most of them are done with no interest. Some of them use low interest to pay for administrative costs, to pay someone to do the bookkeeping, basically. Um, so savings pools, that's a small scale thing, really good. That's one of the things, we're starting one right now in my neighborhood at Earth Haven. That's one of the things that we think is like the early adoption for this thing right now is like you all could go home and start savings pools next week, you know, and get that going. And it's a beautiful relational economics piece. Get together with the people who you already want to be spending more time with, right? And, and you say, we're going we're gonna to all have a dinner once a month at a different person's house. And uh, we all put in money then. We talk about what's going on in each other's lives. We learn about what needs people have that aren't met. Come up with creative ideas for addressing those. And now we have resources that we can help address those needs, right? And then that just starts to organically flow where Cooperate WNC comes in is that we can then start to pull those savings pools together into a larger shared fund. And this is what's actually happening organically in New Zealand right now. There are about 200 savings pools, small savings pools going on. They're pulling all that into a common fund. Yeah? Do you have directions on your Co Cooperate WNC website how to start a savings pool? Uh, I don't, but I have a phone call in three days with the guy Brian in New Zealand who's coordinating the whole thing, and he has a game called the Savings Pool Game that's about helping a group of people to get it really visceral. You basically enact a savings pool in abbreviated time frames right, through the game. Um, so that's, that's, I think, a really good way of learning is to distribute the game. Because there's, there's also some emotional stuff with this. Like, we're all, we're all in a pretty scarred you know, uh, economic condition in this country from being, you know, taken advantage of for 15 generations. And, uh, and so it's like hard to feel trusting with collaborative economics is like, wait, is somebody trying to take advantage of me somehow? Is this a pyramid scheme or something? Right? So playing the savings pool game helps to build trust and to make it, it's a very simple, transparent thing. Nobody's making money off it. No, we're not pretending like money's appearing out of thin air. Everyone's just saving money and then choosing to loan to each other when we want to with no interest, right? But it's nice to have a visceral experience of that and get to kind of have that feeling of safety with it. So that's, I think, I think a good step with that. And I will be getting that up there and access to the, to the, um, the uh, PDF to print up the game as soon as we have the file. Can you yeah. Um, Cooperatewnc.org. Yeah. Co-operatewnc.org. Um, so then meta savings pools, right? Pulling a bunch of savings pools together get 100 of these savings pools that are each accumulating ten or $20,000 a year, and you start to have some significant money, right? And now, then say that Graham Potter wants to build her $400,000 community center. She puts in a proposal to cooperate WNC. We might have 10 people put in proposals that month or that year. All the members of cooperate WNC who now have put <coughs> money in through our savings pools, we get to democratically vote on the proposals we want to fund along with a professional loan vetting process, which is part of what I was talking with Jane Hatley at Self-Help about, is using their existing loan officer system, people who are trained to assess business ideas and see how viable they are, using them to both uh, separate out the wheat from the chaff in terms of good ideas, but also to help people develop ideas to be better before they get funded, right? So that's part of how it's a micro-rise, of how Cooperate, Co Cooperate WNC is envisioned as being the mycorrhizal fungus, helping to create that scale to allow us to do things that we can't do on our own. I want to stop there for a second and see if there are any comments or questions. Well, you could, you could definitely push that metaphor a lot further than you did. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe in a minute. You, yeah. you said culture is like topsoil, so the, that's, right. that's where the mycorrhizal model hey. fits in because in topsoil it creates the cohesion and to create the cohesion between our cultures yeah and also 
the more topsoil you have, the better the soil holds on to water and nutrients and doesn't let them leave the system, right? That's the same thing as in this, right? Kathy. Yeah, I'll just put in a plug for the AshevilleTimeBank.org. Yeah. Um, which uh, you can join without having to go to any special orientation. But um, like anything else, where there's skills being shared or swapped or exchanged, the larger it is, the more diverse it is, especially diversity really counts in a time bank, um, the more likely you are to be able to get a need met and also to be able to contribute what you enjoy contributing. Mm. Thank so, you. A plug. Right. One more com or two more comments, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, back up, back there. I haven't heard you speak yet. Um, I'm really interested in what software systems people are using ah, yes. for this. Like in Australia, what are they using there to bring all those, or New Zealand to bring all those those things together? Because I think that is a actually a, a, a real tangible mycorrhiza mm -hmm. type yeah. structure that I think is really important. I mean, I've been thinking about these types of ideas for a long time, and I think. A platform that facilitates this because we do want it to happen organically yeah. but at the same time we also want it to happen on national scale and yeah. we want it to happen quickly uh -huh. so if we can create software systems that actually encapsulate a lot of this functionality bring transparency to it you know all that kind of stuff then it's yeah. a it's a template that can be immediately reproduced Absolutely. across the board will you join our technology working group please we have one and, and it's already some other skilled software designers and web developers who are working on there. A few other few tools that have been envisioned in relation to this. Thank you. But yeah. remember that it's a pretty fragile system. Yeah, it's we wouldn't want to build a system a lot that was of only that. Malevolent forces right. that can do right. some damage pretty easily. Right. You know? But as long as yes, yeah, so one of the guiding principles of I think this in relation to technology is that we're never we never want to fill a function with technology that we're not also filling with human connection. And that's one of the things that I think makes this different from other things that are more abstract and kind of global in nature, yeah. And I think the solution is just to make sure it's redundant. Right, you know, exactly. That you have backup that can't right. be trashed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's a movie out called Tomorrow. <laughs> Has anybody seen it? <laughs> I, highly, I highly recommend it. It's a couple, husband and wife that toured different countries and visited cities and villages that are taking upon themselves to create their own economics mm -hmm. and, it's very, and they're, it's working it's very successful tomorrow is the name of the title thank you so um so just going on with uh thanks for coming y'all <laughs> yeah no it's okay um just going along i wanted to make sure that uh there was a point emphasized that i'm not sure if i emphasized before which is that like with with graham potter and with our imagery of the mycorrhizae um, <clears throat> what we think we came really clear to with this visioning retreat that Pat and some other people were at too was um, this is distributed initiative. It's not like we're trying to top down manage a bunch of different community centers. It's that we're trying to find where there are already existing zones of initiative. People who are doing good stuff, who have something going on, who have some resources, um, who have some skills and knowledge, and then we're trying to help them remove limiting factors and link up with the larger system, right? So that's another way that the imagery of the mycorrhizae teaches us. Like a, what, what actually happens, it's so beautiful when you get down to how the biology works. It's so instructive, right? What actually happens is when a tree seed germinates, it sends out hormones from its rootlets, and those rootlets cause mycorrhizal spores that are present in the soil already to hatch out into threads which then connect with the tree. So the mycorrhizae responds to the first movement from the tree that is beginning to grow and is putting out those hormones. So it's like finding the signals of what's already going on, you see what I'm saying? And then coming in to support those and bring the sugars and bring the, the information to them, the tools is what we're talking about in terms of information. I should mention asset mapping here because this is another one of the big things that came out, came out of our visioning retreat a couple weeks ago. Um, who's, who here is familiar with the term asset mapping? All right, great. So good, good half of the folks. Yeah, and um, you know, it's not. It's pretty intuitive, but but it's really worth saying, which is we don't want to redo any work that other people and organizations are already doing really well. In fact, we want to find what folks are doing and work with it and connect it up and make it more effective. So asset mapping is the process of mapping out in a 
whatever you, scope it is. It could be in this room. What are the assets that people have in this room? Financial, social, skill-wise, all the different types of assets. It could be in Buncombe County. It could be in all of Western North Carolina. And you find out what are all of the organizations and resources, skill bases, um, resources besides money. What are all of those things that exist? And especially, what are the gaps in those assets? right? And then that's where you put your energy to be most effective as an organization. So that's what we're gearing up to is a, is a Western North Carolina-wide asset mapping project. Um, that's probably the big thing to do this year is kind of what the advice that, that we're getting. And then, but then specifically, there's a whole other la layer of it that people call community-based asset mapping, which is distinct. It's not a top-down thing again where it's like this study research committee going around like scientists uh, observing everybody under a microscope. It's rather identifying the existing leaders in each community or the people who are taking initiative, maybe is a better way to say it, and then helping to resource and train those leaders to do their own asset mapping. And then you're accomplishing multiple functions because at the same time that you're mapping, you're also helping leadership and initiative to develop and strengthening the local networks in each place. So that's what we're looking at is how can we do that, but also create a coherent asset mapping of W and C to help us understand where to put energy first in this uh, mutual aid initiative. Yeah. Uh, that's something that I've been kind of addressing in my own thoughts of up in Hawk Creek. Huh? Yeah. We have a, now have a commons, Hawk Creek Commons, and some a spiritual group started it out of a, out of a church. It's not Christian based or any base, but that's where they're using it. That space. And they have different, it's a meeting place for people in the community, to, for, for talks, for different, all different types of activities. Yeah. And at the same time, I see um, we're being told by uh, Asheville that now we need, uh, they're going to start spending money on our library. And I'm looking, we really need to bring that together more cohesively. The library, yeah, libraries are wonderful, but so many people are not using them now because they aren't more, yeah. aren't offering more things. I'd yeah. like to see a tool library, yeah. an art library, you know, a, a lot of things like that that really get the people engaged more. Most people drive by the uni libraries these days. Right, totally. Because they're just reading on the internet. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to figure out how, who do I approach on that? Mm -hmm. Do I have to go right to the city and say, hey, you guys, wake up, look what's really going on here. Yeah. Do you know anything about the commons that are being built uh, throughout Asheville? I know there's one on Haywood also. I don't. No. I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah. And that's a, but that, and that's a great principle, I think, you're illustrating of, of that's a great nut, different example from the one I gave in Jackson County, which is a privately owned property, so with a business. And yet, here's a totally different idea, working with public property, right? And so that's how wide-ranging the different types of trees and shrubs in the ecosystem can be. But then how can they all be linked and working with a similar set of principles? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, maybe you're going to address this, but I'm wondering the connection between what you're talking about and um, this cooperative structure yeah. mantra. Um, However, you say Montagon. Yeah. Um, so, does is cooperative business development part of the vision, and how does it fit in? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think it is different than Montagon um, because so this this didn't get highlighted too much in Pat's presentation, but it's a really big deal to me that Montagon does not have an inherent land-based or ecological ethic underpinning to its activities. And that's a major um, design flaw for anything in this day and age, in my opinion. And so, in, in my opinion, the, uh, one distinction is that the cooperative businesses are going to have to be based in land concretely and have a transformative ecological approach for any type of business, whether it's a building or an energy co-op or manufacturing or whatever. They're all going to have to be in my opinion, coming from the lens of transformative ecology, climate response. And so then, yes, then uh, anybody who wants to start a cooperative enterprise or another nonprofit that serves the same mission of this cooperative thing, right, puts in a proposal for funding, 
to whatever financial mechanism we end up creating, whether that's a credit union account or smaller savings pool for capital funding to help them get started. And then once they get started, they have access to the audience of the mutual aid society. So say we have 10,000 members in Western North Carolina, then, and I have a building business. I was just talking with somebody on the phone about this earlier today. I have a building business. Well, now I have a 10,000 member kind of family in a way, people who are in ownership of the mutual aid network together and are more in incentivized and likely to support each other's endeavors. So I think that the way it interacts with co-ops is by helping lend them into existence and helping to mentor and support them as they get founded and then help to support them as patrons through kind of loyalty within the system after they've gotten founded. That's my idea of it. What do you think? All right. All right. It's done. <laughs>